Good afternoon, dear colleagues and dear participants. As Associate Dean of FGV Direito São Paulo, I'd like to say that it's a great pleasure to have you all here to start the first session of the fourth and last week of the second of the University of Chicago Fundação Getúlio Vargas Forum in Law and Economics in Brazil. The online second forum, Chicago FGV, fulfills, at least in part, the intention of taking for the joint initiative of our law schools to organize annual meetings on law and economics in Brazil. We believe this online forum is a good example of what we expect to do face to face next year in Rio and Sao Paulo. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you, my colleagues. Omri ben Shaha from the University of Chicago Law School and Rodrigo Viana from FGV Direito Rio. I am grateful for all their energy and enthusiasm to organize this venture. Our special thanks to the Chicago and FGV teams that spare no effort to make this event happen in the best possible way. Before we start, I would like to remind you that all statements expressed by Fundação Getúlio Vargas employees and guests in our online events and broadcasts exclusively represented their opinions and not necessary FGV institutional position. We also reiterate that everyone presents here agreed to participate in this event of their own free will and they consented to be heard in these broadcasts uh, which will be posted later on at FGV's and Chicago's University official channels. Rodrigo, could you please give him some more information to our audience? Well, thank you. Thank you, Maria Lucia. Welcome, everyone, again. So happy for this last week of our second forum. It's really a reality that became uh in a joint effort from chicago from our law schools in rio and sao paulo from fgv and today we have the pleasure to have here professor lisa and brad peterson that will be properly introduced by omri i just would like to say that your presence here really honors us we are very happy to have you here and and for the audience i would like to remind you that you can send your questions and comments to the to the to the lecturers, I will be glad to read them uh, after the presentation if we have time. So I just would like to say many thanks again for all the efforts for all the teams from Chicago and from FGV, and I'm pretty sure that we're going to have a very pleasant afternoon. So Omri, please thanks again and do the proper introduction of Lisa and Brett. Thank you, Rodrigo. And thank you, Maria Lucia. Um, and it's such a pleasure to get to this point, the final week uh, of our joint activity, the Chicago FGV Forum on Law and Economics. And I'm grateful to all the audience from Brazil, the rest of Latin America, and from all over the world, including people who will watch it uh, in their own comfortable time or in uh, Asia and other places uh, later on. It gives me great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Lisa Bernstein, who will also then introduce her co-author, um, uh, Brett Peterson. Uh, Lisa Bernstein, many of you surely already know, is one of the most influential contract scholars of our era. Her work has been, Lisa, I would say now, 30, been going on for 30 years and has shaped the way scholars and students and practitioners think about contract law. Lisa's work introduced us to numerous industries where people have created what she calls private order, namely rules that governs, govern their transactions and their activity, different than the legal rules that replace the legal rules. She was able to study these rules and to learn how the, these industries and these uh, activities create more value relative to what is possible under legal rules, primarily by creating reputation bonds that support exchanges and uh, their uh, commitments in a more precise way. 
She looked at industries like the diamond industry, textile industry, grain industry, hay industry, cotton industry. And in each one of these studies where she interviewed numerous people and studies how the trade organizations and associations govern disputes, she was able, from each of these studies, she was able to detect more and more detail that paint this fascinating project and uh, um, picture of how governance occurs of contracts when people have deals, sometimes huge deals, millions and billions of dollars. They rely on things other than the formal legal system to make sure that the deal goes through. That's kind of the gist of her, of her uh, what she taught us. And the details of it are fascinating and eye-opening and have inspired many, many people, including myself, to learn more and more from, these, uh, from her studies and from these sources and how to think about contracts and contract law. If that wasn't enough, she then recently started, launched a new direction of study. Again, something that probably nobody else did before her and to look at yet another contracting structure that large uh, manufacturers in the US took relationships with their buyers. Calls these, she will call these today managerial contracts. And once again, describe how outside the legal system, norms and practices that are very structured and very specific have developed to make sure that the deals succeed and that more value is gained from them. With that relatively extensive introduction, I would like to pass the baton to a uh, Professor Lisa Bernstein. Uh, thank you for that, Omri. I am very pleased to be joined here today by Brad Peterson, who is a partner at Mayor Brown and runs two of their um, leading outsourcing practices. When I heard we would be joined um, by practitioners and judges, I thought it would be interesting um, for our audience to be able to get Brad's reaction to questions, as well as my own more academic take. So with that, what I'd like to do is begin my talk by inviting you into the world of procurement contracts between large Midwestern integrated product manufacturers and here I mean firms like John Deere, Tractor, Caterpillar, Earthmover, and Harley-Davidson Motorcycles, and their suppliers of component parts. Now, it's fair to say that at first glance, this market might not seem as interesting and sexy as others I've studied, the ones Omri mentioned. The glamorous New York diamond merchants, Southern cotton dealers imbued with the values of America's Old South, the grain merchants who operate all over the world, or the 11th century Maghribi Jewish traders who traded commodities in the 11th century across the Islamic Mediterranean. Nevertheless, as I hope to show you, the contract governance mechanisms that have been developed in this very old economy market are every bit as interesting as those in the sexier private legal systems. And they can also be understood as cooperation inducing private order institutions. Institutions that are more complex given the nature of the transactions that they have to govern, but institutions that like the government structures in these private legal systems really do not depend much on the public legal system to work. So with that background on the table, let's turn to the American Midwest and the market for manufactured parts. This market actually has a very special place of honor in the heart of American contract scholars. Why? Well, it was the setting for Stuart Macaulay's seminal 1963 study that introduced the academy and indeed the practicing world to the informal world of what's called relational contracting, a world where written contracts have very little effect on workaday behavior and are simply put in the drawer, never to be seen again. A world where gentlemen can work anything out over a game of golf or a martini, assuming though one very important thing is true. And that is that you keep the lawyers completely out of it. 
Today, when we returned to this market, what we saw was this. Interpersonal relationships clearly remain very, very important to the way business is done. Yet the role played by formal written contracts and the types of provisions that one finds in these formal written contracts have both fundamentally changed. The contracting relationships between these large buyers and their suppliers of component parts are now governed by highly detailed written contracts, contracts that are absolutely not put in the drawer. These agreements are read and understood by the parties. They're also incorporated into the intra and interfirm information systems that are used to administer the agreements. So they pop up on the screens of the relevant managers at both the supplier and the buyer's firm on a daily basis. They are far from being hidden. And in part because of this, they have a very strong actual effect on the workaday implementation of these contracting relationships. For someone who's not seen these contracts, and I couldn't think of a way to represent them on a slide that would fully communicate to you what they look like, these contracts are long. They incorporate numerous documents and can run into the hundreds of pages. They contain provisions that go far beyond standard legal boilerplate and ordinary terms to include numerous workaday contract governance and contract administration provisions. Provisions that while not legally enforceable in any meaningful sense, nonetheless set out and set out in what can only be described as truly excruciating detail. How materials will be sourced, how components will be produced, how buyer and supplier employees at numerous levels of both organizations will work together. The exact type of information that has to be exchanged and when it has to be exchanged, as well as how the buyer will monitor and assess the quality of the supplier's performance throughout the production process, not as in the old days, just when goods come in and you inspect them. The buyer is involved in the production process from the first days of design up until the good is delivered to the buyer's plant. The widespread use of the provisions that focus on these everyday aspects of exchange are so detailed that they give the buyer the ability to manage most important aspects of the supplier's operations almost as if they were operating as an integrated firm. Why did this happen? Well, in the main, it can be understood as a response to and facilitator of a number of technological and other types of changes that have taken place in American manufacturing. Most important among them, the shift towards outsourcing design and innovation, not just the production of goods as well as the need to meet the quality challenge posed by the introduction of Japanese goods into core US manufacturing markets in the 1980s. Both of these shifts increased the need for buyer and supplier employees to work together throughout the design and production process and to do so much as if they were employed by the same firm. The need for this close coordination in turn created contracting challenges, challenges that simply could not be met using the traditional tool of promises backed by the prospect of court-imposed damages. In these markets, buyers are tasked with assembling interdependent components from hundreds of suppliers that have to work together if they're going to be able to produce their products. They therefore depend on receiving timely delivery of the precise components that they need. Payment for non-performance just doesn't cut it. It's relatively meaningless when it stops your production line for your good as a whole. Indeed, a 1988 study conducted by the American Society for Quality concluded, extensive warranties do not substitute for quality. The report goes on to say, 
that there's pretty much nothing that you can put in a contract that a party will consider as adequate protection for non-performance. So it's against this background and the needs of this market that the workaday contract provisions that govern these procurement contracts, which we characterize as managerial provisions were developed. And it's against this background that their striking resemblance to the techniques used to organize relationships and increase productivity within firms, often referred to as elements of hierarchy is best understood. So if we take a close look at these managerial provisions, what we see is that among their many detailed workaday operational terms are contractual analogs, quite exact contractual analogs of the 18 intra-firm management practices that the World Management Survey identified as being associated with large persistent performance differences across similarly situated enterprises. The World Management Survey, for those who haven't heard of it, is the most comprehensive survey of managerial practices ever undertaken. It covers more than 10,000 firms across the world. Studies based on it have found that the presence or absence of these 18 practices can account for almost 30% of the productivity differences among plants, firms, and countries. These findings raise the possibility that contract provisions that look to these and other elements of intra-firm hierarchy to govern transactions across firms may also have the ability to add significant value to contracting relationships. Now, to set the stage for our discussion, in which I hope to answer your questions, and from our perspective, even more importantly, learn something interesting about your country's contract governance practices, I want to begin by giving you a quick overview of the intra-firm management techniques identified by the World Management Survey and the ways they're incorporated into these contracts. I'll then draw on the description to sketch out a few of the ways that these managerial provisions, when taken together, might contribute to contract governance writ large, wholly apart from the value that each of the provisions creates, taken one at a time. I'll then conclude by discussing just one key implication of managerial contracting for the tasks facing lawyers who want to create contractual value in this and other contracting contexts. As we turn now to looking at how these agreements have succeeded in incorporating and integrating these many aspects of intra-firm hierarchy into these contracts, we're going to see that over time, at least the time from when I was a law student 30 years ago to now, there has been quite a fundamental shift in the core techniques of contract governance. Monitoring and management have largely replaced promising and the disciplining effect of the shadow of the law. And liability rules are no longer the primary drivers of contractual behavior. Rather, they have been replaced by regulatory type rules bonded by first liberal rights of termination and second by the force of network governance. What is network governance? Well, briefly put, it's the multilateral reputation sanctions that arise when information about misbehavior or bad outcomes spreads quickly among closely connected firms in a market, just as negative gossip about one's conduct tends to flow quickly in a small American town. So to get a feel for managerial contracting, let's turn to the 18 value-creating contract practices explored in the world management surveys and look at how they are reflected in contracts. As we walk through them, you'll begin to see that the contract governance structures they create have evolved to the point where buyers are able to functionally replicate through contract most of the benefits associated with vertical integration. And they're able to do this without vertically integrating. This is a finding that raises interesting questions about the theory of the firm and may also provide a partial explanation 
for why one sees such low rates of vertical integration between buyers and suppliers in these markets. So let's take a step back and unpack the content of these contracts. As the slide shows, the World Management Survey broke these contracting and management practices into four categories, operations management, performance monitoring, target setting, and performance management. Turning first to operations management. Procurement contracts typically require suppliers to adopt every single one of the practices in this category. They specify that the supplier has to transition its factory to use lean manufacturing processes, as well as very specific types of quality control systems and quality control checks, typically set out in manuals that themselves exceed 40 pages. Many buyers even go a step beyond requiring the adoption of lean practices. They actually send their own employee training teams into the supplier's plant to teach them how to manufacture in a lean manner. They will stay there in many cases for months and months and months until the task is accomplished. So again, they don't just expect a promise, they actually take steps to make sure that the promise is implemented. The managerial provisions in the contracts also contain many other operations and quality control related rules for micromanaging the supplier's operations, sometimes including its sub-suppliers operations as well. They get as detailed as specifying the precise work instructions distributed on the factory floor. Sometimes, and in some firms, they will even specify the precise placement of a machine and require the supplier to get the buyer's permission to move a machine as little as two inches. Now, when it comes to the next categories, target setting and performance monitoring, all of these practices are also required by contract. The agreements are filled with key performance indicators and describe just how often they're to be calculated and shared. Compliance metrics are tracked on the dashboards of the online contract management systems that are used to administer these agreements. And these systems are designed so that in real time, the data that's visible to the supplier is the same as the data that's visible to the buyer. These contracts also take pains to spell out with specificity the consequences of a supplier failing to meet its obligations and what the supplier have to do to get in a buyer's good graces again after a problem arises. This is done through a process known as the supplier scorecard. There's nothing very mysterious here, just bring to mind any report card you ever got in school. The report card, like the teacher's report card, aggregates information about the supplier's performance in the previous quarter. Sometimes this is solely objective information, like part per million error rates. Other times it includes subjective information. One firm gives a score for wavelength, and that's supposed to be a measure, albeit a subjective measure, of how well the buyer thinks the supplier understands its needs and its future plans. So going back to your report card from school, the supplier report card assigns the supplier a grade. Get an A, and the report card suggests you're going to get more business or better terms. Get a B, people will say, okay, we're going to stay where we are for now, but hey, you might want to think about taking your game up a level. Get a C, and things are a little more dicey. The buyer may cut the buy in the next quarter. The buyer may also demand that the supplier submit remedial plans and a plan for monitoring their implementation. In addition to these techniques, buyers also use a variety of boots on the ground monitoring techniques to ensure that these con contracts are implemented in the way they need to be. 
These techniques range from audits that are purely paper to audits plus plant visits to having buyer employee engineers present to help supervise parts of the supplier's production line. It's really only in the last world management survey category that focuses predominantly on human resources and talent management issues, that there is even a slight divergence between managerial provisions and world management survey practices. This divergence doesn't stem from any inability on the part of transactors to include provisions covering these subjects, Rather, it's due only to arcane legal constraints related to what's known as the independent contractor rules. But even within these constraints, the divergence in practice is slight. These contracts have many provisions dealing with these subjects. They have key personnel provisions that prevent the supplier from replacing managers without the buyer's consent. They often specify the training that each of the workers on the supplier's own production line has to have. They will often require employee exchanges of various types. And sometimes, some firms go even further. They require the supplier to send one of the supplier's own managers to the buyer's plant for intensive training. That person then returns turns to the supplier's plant and is tasked with ensuring that all of the buyer's needs and wants are met within the supplier's organization. Although employed by the supplier, this person is denominated a buyer champion within the supplier organization. In sum, when you take all of these hierarchical management techniques that are employed within a firm and the ways that they are incorporated into these managerial provisions together, what you see is that they do give the buyer the authority to monitor and manage important aspects of the seller's operation, almost to the point that it is the same type of management they would use if the supplier were operating as part of the buyer's firm. So with these practices on the table, what I wanna do is take a step back now and briefly explore the three core ways that these provisions, when viewed as a whole, contribute to contract governance writ large. And they do this in three ways. The first is by facilitating commercial cooperation. The second is by strengthening network governance. And the third is by scaffolding the growth of the types of trust that have been shown in the management literature to be associated with greatly enhanced supplier performance. So let's turn first to the ways that these provisions and the contract administration mechanisms that support them increase the likelihood that commercial cooperation will arise and endure. So, for cooperation to arise, it's quite important that both parties begin their relationship by expecting to cooperate and by expecting their partner to cooperate as well. In these relationships, the supplier qualification process that a supplier has to go through before a contract is even negotiated helps to create this expectation. This process is expensive. It's expensive for the buyer and expensive for the supplier. It involves plant visits, book audits, interviews with employees, the checking of references from current partners, past partners, legal records, and the like. In short, it's so expensive and so extensive that neither firm would have a reason to enter into a contract after completing it unless they expected to begin their relationship with cooperation. As a consequence, once this process is complete, both parties enter the relationship with the expectation that the other will cooperate. Managerial provisions also contain numerous practices that can be understood as being designed to reduce the likelihood 
that a cooperative relationship, once established, will break down. That will break down over a misunderstanding or lack of clarity over what's to be done, or that it will break down because an act of cooperation is mistakenly classified as an act of defection. Let's look first at clarity. The managerial provisions themselves are quite clear and detailed. And in many firms, they are presented along with annotations, clearly setting out their meaning, sometimes complete with lawyer type hypotheticals to show how they would be applied in hypothetical cases. But in addition to this, firms take great pains, and I do mean here great pains, to make sure the terms of these agreements are fully understood. John Deere's website for suppliers contains numerous webinars that focus in detail on what it means by the requirements in its contracts. Caterpillar, who makes the big earth diggers, well, they have created Caterpillar University, a school for their suppliers that gives over a hundred different courses. One focuses even on understanding Caterpillar's terms and conditions. Another focuses on things like how to comply with Caterpillar's quality standards or how to do a weld that Caterpillar will consider up to spec. Honda goes even further, sending its own personnel into the supplier's plant to teach them in a hands-on way how to produce components to Honda's exacting specifications. In addition to these mechanisms, it's important to note that these agreements create numerous channels of communication between the parties and require iterative interactions among buyer and supplier employees. So many that it is actually easy for workers to clarify the understanding of the contract throughout the design and production process. As one manager told me, look, this is just not a problem. When something's unclear, we're in daily contact with our partners and we just pick up the phone and ask. And if it happens on a weekend, on a Saturday, we have their cell phone. We call them at home, we don't guess. However, we all know that even when things are clear, things happen. Bad outcomes occur for whatever reason. And cooperation is vulnerable to breakdown when acts of cooperation could be misclassified as acts of defection simply because something bad happened. So to guard against the prospect of this disturbing one of these relationships, these contracts have a clause known as a root cause provision. A root cause provision requires the supplier to undertake a structured inquiry into the reason for the bad outcome. This is a process developed by managers. You can buy root cause for dummies, a 30 page book that specifies exactly how this analysis is supposed to be conducted. So the supplier is tasked with doing this long investigation and then sharing the evidence it uncovers during the course of the investigation with the buyer, as well as the conclusions that it reaches. Now, this process, while structured, is not perfect, okay? But it does give the buyer a better chance to determine whether a particular bad outcome was just a mistake, one of those things that happens, or some kind of willful defection. So the provision in turn reduces the likelihood that cooperation is going to break down over misclassification of a bad outcome. Now to further guard against this happening and leading to the unraveling of these complex relationships, buyers are careful with the language that they use when dealing with their suppliers and they go to pretty extensive lengths to frame most of the common things that can go bump in the night or wrong in the transaction as problems to be solved, not defections, not breaches. So when a bad outcome occurs, 
They don't have a lawyer call and say, hey, you breached the contract. Rather, they enter something on the computer management system that sends a notice to the other side saying corrective action request. The corrective action request tells the supplier what is displeasing the buyer and asks that the supplier acknowledge the problem and commit to fixing it. If the supplier does this, the word breach will never be used in reference to this unless and until a sustained pattern of non-performance occurs. So taken together, these managerial provisions, as well as a number of other provisions I haven't described that give suppliers more benefits or higher scorecard ratings when they take steps to lengthen the shadow of the future, have created a framework that enable these firms to enter into long-term and highly cooperative contracting relationships. Let's now turn to the second core way these provisions contribute to contract governance, and that is by enhancing network governance, strengthening the multilateral reputation-based sanctions that would be imposed if the contract were breached. To get a sort of gut feeling about how this force operates, it's useful to look at a slide. The slide maps out the contractual connections among three large Midwestern manufacturers and their suppliers. These contractual relationships are denoted by the black lines. The gray lines denote the many contractual connections among the suppliers themselves. Just like in a small town, this dense web of connections among these market transactors creates conditions where word of misbehavior or incompetence is likely to spread, and it's likely to spread fast. In fact, if you run standard network metrics on the market pictured in the firm, what pops out is that any firm in this network can get information about any other firm in this network by going through only two steps. A number that's likely to be even smaller once all of the social and other connections among employees of this, these firms are taken into account. Since this is a market where employee churn is near continuous and people tend to work at five or six firms across the life of their career. So in this market, firms know that if they engage in misbehavior to one contracting partner, this will become quickly known or knowable throughout the market or at least an important and highly relevant subset of the market. And that this knowledge will affect their current relationships with their other contracting partners, as well as their ability to attract new partners in the future. The multilateral reputation sanctions created by these connections are what's referred to as the force of network governance. And in these markets, it's the force of network governance together with a fear of termination of the relationship or reduced order size that bonds parties' commitments to these managerial provisions. It would be a very rare instance indeed where breach of a managerial provision would give rise to a credible threat to sue. Now, what do managerial contracts have to do with strengthening network governance? Well, the large buyers who create these managerial provisions require all of their suppliers to follow the same provision. And these provisions are posted publicly on their website for all to see. Many times they're compiled neatly into well-organized supplier handbooks, quality manuals, or other clearly documented and named sets of policies and procedures. This standardization of obligation lets market participants who hear, oh, Joe did X, to better assess whether X was or was not in compliance with the party's contract, since the terms of the contract are easily accessible and can be seen by all. This makes reputation information more accurate and more powerful 
then it would be in a market where the terms to be bonded are transaction specific and private. Although I will note here that the force of network governance has been documented and shown to be quite powerful, even in markets with transaction specific terms. But here we don't have that additional complication and these managerial provisions tend to be successfully bonded largely outside the shadow of the public legal system. So I now wanna to turn just very briefly to the third core way that managerial provisions and the contract administration mechanisms used to implement them contribute to the governance of these agreements. And that is they scaffold the growth of the three core types of trust that the management literature views as of central importance to these relationships. The first type of trust is competence-based trust. That is just a belief that the supplier can perform. This type of trust is well seated by the supplier qualification process I mentioned earlier. And it's augmented over the life of the relationship as buyer and supplier employees interact, audit, and work with one another to solve problems over time. In addition, the managerial provisions I just described, together with the online contract management systems that administer them and guide the parties through many multi-step processes that are specified in these agreements, contribute in quite a meaningful way to the creation of inter-organizational process-based trust, a type of trust that arises when each contracting party views the other contracting party's actions as predictable. This type of trust has been shown in the management literature to lead to more successful buyer-supplier relationships and to itself scaffold and facilitate the growth of the type of interpersonal trust between buyer and supplier managers that, as in Macaulay's day, makes these transactions work so much better. Now, having explored the governance-related benefits of managerial contracting, I just wanna close by noting that to fully exploit the benefits of the managerial approach and to devise new and effective ways to create contractual value, lawyers can benefit greatly from studying not just the world management survey practices, but the wide variety of management tactics used within firms. I would also like to suggest on a more fundamental level that lawyers are going to have to reorient their thinking when they go to draft contracts to recognize and recognize in a very detailed and particular way that it is not just the terms, the contracts between the firms that will determine how well the contracting relationship functions, but also the ways that these cross-firm provisions will interact often in quite dynamic ways with the organizational structure and relationships within each of the firms. Because it's only when both sets of considerations are taken into account that a lawyer is going to be able to fully understand the effect that a particular set of contract terms is likely to have on behavior. I'll give you just two um, quick examples. So the management literature has very clearly shown that how well strategic alliances work depends on whether or not both parties to the transaction have a dedicated strategic alliance management function in each of their organizational hierarchies. The studies show that alliances where both firms have these departments work far better and do not require all of the contract governance provisions okay, that are needed when these departments do not exist. So if a lawyer doesn't understand that the presence or the absence of these internal divisions is going to influence the success of the alliance, they might put in too many contract provisions or too, many, too few contract provisions relative to the optimal number of provisions. By a similar token, take a firm that, a buyer firm that wants a supplier to use lean manufacturing. 
well. One thing that's well known is that lean manufacturing increases productivity and often increases it tremendously. But a transformation to lean manufacturing requires buy-in from the actual employees on the supplier's factory floor. Now let's think about it. In a non-unionized firm, if these employees succeed in implementing lean manufacturing, they might be concerned that the buyer will fire them as productivity increases because they'll no longer be needed. If we're looking at a firm where the relational contracts between employees and employers are sufficient so that the employees do not have this worry, lean manufacturing might be implemented with little fuss. On the other hand, if these employees want to resist it, they're going to be able to resist it. And indeed, this has been one of the major barriers to buyers successfully persuading suppliers to move to lean. It is a problem that Honda devised a very good solution to. Honda's lawyers began to include provisions in their contracts with their suppliers where the suppliers had to commit to Honda not to lay off any of their employees in the course of or soon after a lean transformation. And what do you know? Honda's attempts to get American manufacturers to transition to lean that had previously failed suddenly began to succeed. The contract provision was the key to the implementation of the agreement. So on a broader level, I want to leave you with the thought that understanding the ways that contract provisions interact with the party's internal governance structure is a task that lawyers will have to keep front and center, not only when they're drafting procurement contracts for large integrated manufacturers, but also when they're working on various types of business outsourcing agreements and other types of quintessentially new economy types of agreements, like biotechnology alliance agreements, where the tasks to be governed also require close coordination and interaction among both parties' employees and meaningful managerial provisions are beginning to creep into parties' relationships. In short, my point is the new economy has a lot to learn from the techniques being used in the old economy by firms that are usually considered the dullest of the dull. So with that, I will open the floor to any questions or comments that you might have. And again, Brad and I are very interested in learning about the practices of your countries if there's information that you want to share. So thank you very much. And I will turn it over now to our moderators. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, very much for the terrific presentation. Uh, I will quote uh, Mariana Pargendler, who is the next lecturer on this Thursday. She's watching uh, through the YouTube and she just sent uh, a comment that it's such a terrific presentation. So thank, thank you very much once again. Well, before we receive uh, some questions from, from, the awesome, from the audience, please feel free to send. I, I, have a, a, I would like to hear Brad and Lisa, Brad, maybe from the from the lawyer side, and Lisa from the academic side. That well, um, there is a there is a thought that sometimes contracts, uh, when we have lawyers from each side to design a contract, and they have a, a tough negotiation, and, and usually the contracts reflect this. And and but. What do I think is that the contracts really helps to coordinate uh, the desires of the of of the parties that are involved in this, and and we are really specifically in those times of uh, in these times of COVID and and so difficulties in the economy, a lot of people recurring to uh, ADR. Uh, uh, methods of uh, dispute resolution. So I would like to hear about 
the possibilities. I know that Lisa is an enthusiast of, of commercial dispute uh, 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 institution specific ones, specific for developing countries and economies. So uh, at what point it's important as well to, to have provisions in this sense in contracts and how it helps to to keep a good relationship between the parties and, and everyone that it's involved in and, and how uh, the legal the legal world read it, it's uh, um, reflecting this in designing contracts and getting this into arbitration or mediation or conciliation uh, procedures. Um, well, I can start off from the academic point of view. Um, I personally am an advocate of industry specific dispute resolution, although I do tend to have more serious reservations about general commercial arbitration. And I don't actually think that these contracts have optimally integrated the available types of dispute resolution into their provisions. I've always thought that if I were going to be designing these provisions, I would find it desirable to use what's called in a somewhat sexist way, a wise man provision. That would be an expert perhaps in quality, who if there was a quality dispute that the parties simply could not work out, would be asked to come in, do their own quality inspection and rule just on that narrow issue. So I think in those respects for very technical aspects, there is a little bit of room here for better value creation in some industries if you bring in wise man experts. But there's- Would, would it be the expert determination? Uh, what, what you usually call the expert? It's, it's something related to this? Well, it could be. But it would also depend, and as, an, as a law and economics person, it's hard to um, refer to such soft characteristics, but I, I hope you'll um, give me a little leeway to mention an institution like this that exists in the cotton industry. So unlike grain, where if you take two grain dealers, they'll look at a bushel of grain and probably grain, grade it in the same way, cotton grading is subjective. So there's always been this sense in the industry that two gentlemen can disagree. So the industry formed something called the Cotton States Arbitration Board. And that is a board that only makes quality determinations when quality is disputed. So if you and I are dealing for 10 years and every now and again, we go and have the wise man make a quality determination, everything is fine because that's what gentlemen do. Occasionally they go to the tribunal. But if we were to do this all the time, our relationship would break apart. We'd never do business again. No one could operate like this. So when I look at these relationships here, I say to myself, if wise men could be built into these relationships and regarded as people you go to on rare occasion when there's a genuine disagreement and they were viewed as being just a contract administration mechanism, just like you send a corrective action request email, you'd say, okay, today we're gonna send this one off to John. I think they could add value, but we don't actually see that being done in many of the manufacturing contexts. Um, there are sometimes arbitration provisions, but my interview evidence suggests that parties are no more likely to go to arbitration than they are to litigation, because once you have to do that with a contracting partner, you basically don't want to do business again. So I'll turn it over to Brad, who probably has more um, varied industries to draw on in answering your question. It, it is an interesting question because I agree with you that there are, you would expect there to be a heavy use of alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. Um, and we, I'm, I'm a fan myself, but what we've actually seen is, yes, there are very difficult contract negotiations. The parties realize that they may have difficulty, although the difficult contract negotiations almost inevitably are difficult because the parties are coming from a different place. And the result of the difficulty is, you know, like any difficult project, you end up with something that's better and more clear. When we 
talk to our clients, they generally are seeking a dispute resolution mechanism that is so difficult that it would never be used and so expensive that it would ever, never be used. And almost, as Lisa said, it would be, you know, they would view it as almost a disaster if somebody said, yes, I'm going to take it to litigation or I'm going to take it to an arbitrator. And what they instead expect is that as higher and higher levels of the organization become involved, wiser and wiser people will come together and reach resolutions. Or failing that, they will simply walk away. And then the role of the courts will be not that we actually use the courts for resolution, but that we look to past court judgments and try to figure out what an appropriate settlement might be. I agree with, I agree with everybody that this probably sub-optimizes that um, that it would be better to be able to bring people in. And in real estate, for example, the architect often serves as that on, in that honest broker role or in a major building where if there are questions about what the blueprint means, for example, they have designated neutrals who know the, the blueprints in advance, know the work plan and whom you, who you can come to because they're ready to answer the tough questions. And that's, that's, been driven in major construction by the fact that you don't have you don't have days you don't have hours you have to do this right away. Um, and I think I just want to add one more thing that if you go back to the studies that talk about the importance of each of the firms having an alliance management um, function and how those relationships tend to work better, dispute resolution may be one of the reasons they work better. So imagine you have two lower level managers who are having a dispute. They may each want to grab the largest part of the pie they can, thinking that this dispute between them is a one-off type of thing. On the other hand, once that disagreement goes up the food chain, it is up there with the two guys who every Friday have a whole list of things that they have to work out. They know one another. They know they're going to be there every Friday. That This is going to keep happening. And the odds are much higher that they are going to work it out or trade my issue for your issue or something like that. So when you look at the variance in dispute resolution, it tends to be focused on how disputes move up the hierarchy of each organization as Brad was suggesting. And that is a very, very important part of these agreements. Perfect, perfect. Well, we have a question here from Maria Eugenia. Well, the presentation was terrific indeed. Speaking about sector specific analysis, here in Brazil, our big market and hence some big companies are located in the commodities industry or infrastructure sectors. Very commonly, they also have a strong relationship with the Brazilian state. Have the professors ever studied companies with this kind of profile? Well, I have studied um, the cash commodity markets, albeit without government firms um, being involved. And I studied these because in green, cotton, hay, rice, tea, all of these different commodities in the United States, the industries have opted out of the legal system and created their own private arbitration systems that in turn administer their own privately drafted trading rules. And these have proved amazingly successful for supporting trade. So commodities to me are sort of a prime example of where private ordering and private legal systems can work. Whether they could work with state involvement, this I don't know because I've never studied state involvement in contracting. Um, when it comes to infrastructure, by the same token, Brad may have something to say, but I've never looked at um, construction or infrastructure related markets. So I'm sorry, I don't have any insight into those. Yeah, I, interestingly, in the commodity space, um, there are, when I work with people, we've worked with some major commodity companies, you know, some of the, the world's leaders in that area, because the American Midwest is you know, home to ADM and Cargill and Bungie and lots of others. Um, there are very, there's not much use of contracts. There's the contract of, you know, I'm, you know, the short term, I'm buying 
winter wheat at this price, but there are very few major long-term contracts. It's just not the way the, the world works. Um, infrastructure is a completely different area with very large projects with an enormous amount of complexity. And there, I, it's not an area that I've worked in a, a great deal, but I do know that they rely on experts far more. Um, well, uh, we, we just, um, we have just passed here in Brazil and came into force uh, the Data Protection Act uh, and uh, also a lot of compliance rules for companies. And of course, it interferes a lot and directly in contracts. And, and we have in the audience a lot of uh, young lawyers, promising lawyers, and, and I think uh, I would just give the opportunity to you to um, maybe talk about and give some tips about the profile of a good contract manager that will work with compliance or data protection as a data protection officer and, and how does it interfere in contracts and, and how they manage that part of their work in, 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 or in a, in a, in a law um, department in a specific company or in a big law firm because uh, these are the new uh, job offers that we have in, 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 the, in, the, in the lawyers market here in Brazil. A lot of people really study and, and, and being capacitated in, in data protection and compliance and, and this off, of course is also related to managing contracts and the importance of governance in, in contracts. I think, uh, Brad, that is more squarely in your domain than mine. And it has been, it's been amazing over the past 15 years, the way the topic of privacy, which was sort of obscure, has now become an area where all, every law firm has a privacy group. And we actually have a group of um, dozens of lawyers working on data security and data privacy. All of our clients have chief privacy officers and they often have compliance teams working on privacy topics. There are, um, not only do you, you know, you have new laws there, but there are new laws all over the world and even places like Europe who are early leaders in coming up with laws are completely redoing them. We had California was our early leader in coming up with a state law, which has been followed by Colorado and Washington and some others. So it's a great area to get into. It's, um, it's, there's a lot of complexity. There's a tremendous amount to learn. The other, the thing that makes it most interesting um, in relation to this presentation is that we've talked about how the use of technology is transforming the way manufacturers work. And they do so by having deep, deep understanding, mostly through electronics, of how, the, the, how, how their suppliers work. And, they, and we talked about the independent contractor laws, but the privacy laws are equally concerning. You would not want to know too much about the workers because there's a risk that you would violate the personal rights of the workers. And there are issues like that all over. And at the same time, in almost every contract I'm seeing, we're seeing pressure from the big data analytics perspective that the, uh, each party will be interested in getting as much data as they can from the other party. And customers will be asking suppliers to provide extraordinarily detailed data so that the customers can find new ways to optimize and build up their supplier handbooks and be more effective. And so data privacy will link into the, this general data strategy area, which will be considering the way that artificial intelligence is growing, the continuing you know, Moore's law every 18 months, the power of computing platforms doubles, the continuing increase in the power of software and enterprise systems I believe that a young lawyer going into data strategy, not just data privacy, but data security and then data use will have a rich career for decades ahead. 
Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Brad. Well, we have a question from Fernanda Monsu. Uh, would the logic of governance mentioned in the presentation work? in a system where Well, if this is the question from the chat, I can read it aloud and then attempt to answer it. So the question in the chat is, would the logic of governance mentioned in the presentation work in a system where there are many corporate groups? Would it be necessary for the entire group to coordinate its governance? I'm not 100% sure what's meant here um, by corporate group, um, but, it, a couple of things that I might um, nonetheless say. So the first is that when these practices came to be introduced in the United States, there were some barriers to their introduction. Imagine a buyer firm who was the first to approach its supplier with a 40 page manual saying, you have to comply with this. That supplier might've reacted, Ooh, who are you? What is wrong with you that you want to micromanage me and just run out the door? Okay. So there were some barriers to the introduction of these particular managerial techniques. What helped overcome the barriers was an action by the US government. They sponsored a project to develop the Malcolm Baldridge criteria for good manufacturing practices. And the Department of Commerce then sponsored awards that would be given to companies who complied with these criteria or came close. So the government action sort of said, okay, this is what good buyers require. This isn't what scary litigious buyers require. These are best practices. Then you slowly, slowly start firms wanting to get this award and going towards these practices. Then the International Standards Organization, the ISO got into this with ISO 9001, okay? And they said, hey, it really is best practices to have a quality manual with all of this detail. Then the Automotive Industry Action Group got into it and said, hey, we can even do better than ISO 9001. We're automotive. We know how things should be done in America. And they put out their own sets of regulations and best practices, including really extensive processes for the development and introduction of new products, some of which require firms to jump through 20 different hoops after the design of a product, a prototype is made, and then you have to go through all these numerous detail and different steps, which are worse than filling out US tax returns in order to be able to commence the running of your production line. So my instinct would be that these things would be easier to effectuate to the extent there were fewer players if each group is seen as a player. But as long as the requirements are posted in there for all to see, the force of network governance anyway should be sufficient. If you wanted as groups of firms to capture this kind of benefit, with this smaller number of people, it might be possible to create a trade association like the cotton dealers have or the grain dealers have that could support this sector of an economy better than individualized private contracting or sort of publicly posted managerial terms combined with more idiosyncratic other contract provisions. But I will turn this over to Brad who might have more experience with industry groups. I, 
I agree with Lisa. I might take it even a step further and say that um, the logic of the governance not only can work with a variety of corporate groups, but works better and better the more corporate groups are involved. Um, the power of the, the network governance all by itself depends on the, the number of people you have working on it. Also, the all of this has, you know, I've been watching this, I've been at this for 20 some years and I've been watching it develop and you see ideas come from one company to another and in a very continued way. And so this, I, the idea that, you know, you're getting to clarity and this root cause analysis concept and the revelation of strategy and the scorecard process, um, when you have negotiations with lots of different clients and they use the exact same words to describe what they're talking about, you might say, well, this is, this is a little odd, but then you realize that it doesn't work any other way that when, the, when someone uses new words to describe even the same ideas, the suppliers become confused and, and look for the, you know, look, look to push back to what the herd as a whole is doing. And then the more, the larger the network and the more sets of interconnected networks you have, the stronger network governance is. Um, Lisa put up a slide showing a network with three primary suppliers, but imagine how much stronger that is when you have 300 or 3000 suppliers. And that creates that greater public knowledge of what needs to be done and um, an ability to translate. Um, and then on process-based trust, the, the fact that the people are all moving from one company to another, and here in the United States, you know, just in sort of the narrow procurement group, we have um, a, a limited number of industry associations that all these people are, you know, get back in the back in the day before the pandemic got together and, you know, sit down and have drinks and talk about how best to resolve these issues means that you get the emergence of process-based trust that Lisa talked about. And that re results in greater interpersonal trust also, because you can say, yeah, I've, you know, I've never met this person, but they sound a lot like other people that I have worked with. And I think I can predict what they're going to do next because everything they do so far has been predictable. I, I would tend to agree with Brad and just say, that even over the two years that I've been looking into managerial provisions, I've increasingly heard people re refer to them now as international best manufacturing practices, which is not something that I heard even two years ago. So you're not viewed really as a big bad buyer because you're imposing these terms on a supplier. Indeed, many times a supplier might be very happy that the big bad buyer has come along and imposed the terms. Think about it. I'm running a small supplier and I wake up one morning and I say to my employees, hey guys, you gotta do more and I'm not gonna pay you anymore. Well, the guys might get pretty mad at me as the owner of that plant. But now imagine I come in and I say, great news everyone. I've just gotten a great contract to deal with Honda. This is gonna give us more job security. This is gonna be our client where we show the world we can grow and we can do it. But by the way, you have to work a little bit harder and change these practices. Sort of, my hands are tied, gentlemen. I'm so sorry, but look, we gotta do it. Now, yes, it's imposed, but the supplier may be delighted. The supplier may be sitting there and wanna transition to mean but not have the money to go out and hire consultants. So when John Deere comes along and says, hey, deal with us and we'll send in the team, we'll remake your plant, everything will be terrific. And guess what, it's at our expense. The supplier might just say, I'm yours, take me, that's fantastic. So you have to sort of be a little bit careful when you think about this, because even though it looks like it's being imposed from the buyer's side, there are good reasons that suppliers might be perfectly happy to be forced to use these best manufacturing um, practices. So it's a little bit tricky. 
And I currently have um, a project out in the field that will hopefully be able to add some sort of fine-grained understanding to what we have found out so far. I'm starting to look at the communications within um, a supplier, a buyer supplier contract administration platform to get a better handle on how things are handled and how disputes are resolved and the types of language um, that are used. But that is in the works and not quite ready for prime time yet. Well, uh, many. Brad would like to. Are, are you going to comment or no? Ah. I'll say I'll okay, no, because I said you're, you're moving. So, well, Lisa, thanks a lot for reading the question. I had an internet instability for, for a moment. Well, I think we have uh, time for a last question. There is a, a question coming here from the Q&A. Well, thank you for the presentation. Very interesting. The presentation, especially the benefits for cooperation coming from the clarity of provisions, made me think of the benefits of standardization of contracts. I have read some papers about how the standardization of contracts could be beneficial in many aspects, but how it could also create costs to deviate from the standard and create transaction specific terms. If possible, it would be interesting to hear the opinion of the professors on this subject. Thanks again. Well, I mean, I think that um, these managerial terms are not notably flexible. They really do tend to be standard to the buyer and required of all suppliers on a formal level. Okay? Whether they are individuated at all in practice is something that I am hoping to look at um, in the coming months as I continue my investigations. So far, I have found that there are times where you have a standard contract provision. It may say, we're going to audit you every four months or something like this. But after a number of years of good performance, the buyer might say, you know what, we don't need to come this time. Everything is fine. So you do see some deviations from these sort of fixed terms in practice. I have not seen a lot of individuated modification, though, of the quality requirements and things like this. Although it's true, there could be hiding in some of the appendices to the contracts that are not available from the public contract system. So I can't really answer that particular question with much precision. I'll see if Brad, who has access to more aspects of the contract, has anything to say. But from my perspective, I haven't seen it. We, uh, here in the United States, we can choose whether to adopt standard contracts and there are standard terms available for almost anything you might want. And so individual contracting parties make their decisions. And in some areas, the contracts are very, very standard across the industry. In other areas, there's almost no standardization. What we're seeing in areas like manufacturing, and let me go to your, uh, your data security example. There are, ISO, there are standards from um, uh, here, the National Institute of Science and Technology, NIST has some standards. ISO has ISO 27001, probably the most widely adopted. The accounting profession has um, statement of accounting controls, SOC 1, and, um, oh, and there's also SOC 2, which is on data security. And each of these is a standard. And these are detailed standards that you can incor essentially incorporate by reference. The parties agree that those standards will apply. And so we're in some ways getting the best of both worlds. Let's say we could in each contract include 100 pages on data security, but we don't. Instead, what we all say is, okay, I'm proposing not 100 pages of data security terms. I'm proposing that you be certified to comply with ISO 27001. And the supplier says, you know, you're not the first who's asked me that. In fact, you're not, you know, you're the hundredth who's asked me that. I am certified and I will promise to be certified under ISO 27001 for the remainder of the term of the contract. Tremendously helpful. 
obviously complying with, uh, you know, conflicting standards is ex itself expensive, but it's also very expensive to negotiate through a data security provision. And there are standards, you'd be amazed at how many standards there are in supply chain management and production operations and things of that sort at very detailed levels. And that gives you the benefit of both custom terms for things where it's helpful to custom and standardized terms for what I think is the, I, I think probably 20 years ago, the standardized terms were 10%. Now they might be 90%. Perfect. Uh, well, I think that's it for now. Uh, I would like on behalf of FGV uh, say that we are tremendously happy to have Lisa and Brad. It was a pleasure to have you here as well, just in, in this, this mix of, of, of views of the academic and, and, and from the market. It was great to hear from you, so didactic, so clear. Uh, wonderful ideas. So it was, I uh, will really hope to have you presentially next year, probably in, in Sao Paulo or in Rio. We want to, to promote this forum presentially as well. Uh, so many thanks again. My acknowledgements to all your ideas and papers and books and works that you are, and for the time that you share this with us, all your knowledge. And I would love, of course, uh, before giving you the floor for your last words, give floor to Maria Lucia, my colleague, and many thanks, Maria Lucia, for making this happen. So thanks, Lisa, again. Thanks a lot, Brad. It was a pleasure. I Thank just you. want to add one thing. Please, I please, very please, much please. apologize for not being able to be here on Thursday. It is the first class of the semester. Uh, I would love to hear what my colleague has to say, but alas, I've been directed to show up in my classroom at the appointed time. So I'll be unable to do so, but no disrespect is intended. Not a problem. I very much hope to see it on YouTube. Okay. Very kind oh. of you, many thanks. Yeah. Okay, many thanks Rodrigo, many thanks Lisa, many thanks Brad for this valuable lecture. We really enjoy your presence and your generosity for this uh, lecture. Thank you so much. I do hope uh, we have all enjoyed this great opportunity. And uh, I would like to invite you to join us again this Thursday at the same time, 3 p.m. Chicago and 5 p.m. Sao Paulo Hill. And uh, this Thursday, you will have a lecture about the economic analysis of contract law in comparative perspective by Professor Mariana Pagenda, our dear colleague from FGV today to uh, Sao Paulo. Thank you all. And uh, really a pleasure to have you.